September 6, 2022. End stage cancer were the words I heard, and I went numb. Glad that my daughter, Julie, was there to ask all of the questions that I just couldn't wrap my head around. What kind of metastasized cancer were we even talking about? It was lung cancer metastasized to my spine and iliac bone. How long did I have to live? Six months to one year, they said. What treatment options were available to me? There were no targeted immunotherapies unless I wanted to undergo non-targeted chemo. So there were no other treatments. I was literally told, go home and live my life as best I could. The only good news that day was that two weeks of radiation would make a big difference in terms of how much pain I was feeling in my iliac. And it did make a big difference. I left the doctor's office feeling terrified and out of control. I, who could always find a solution to the problem if I just tried harder, had to acknowledge that there were no solutions to this one, at least none that the traditional Western medical approach had to offer. I was going to have to look elsewhere for alternative help. So I want to talk just very briefly about my treatment plan first. With the help of a very dear friend, I discovered Michael Brothman, an amazing researcher of alternative cancer treatments from California, who sent me 18 pages of alternative approaches to consider after he had reviewed all of my diagnostic studies and consulted with me by phone, two days after he had done that. I felt so frustrated when I couldn't get my oncologist to even read with me what some of the approaches were. Uh, I understand they are trained very differently, but it was obvious that I was gonna have to figure out what my treatment plan was. And two dear friends who had walked their own journeys with non-traditional medical treatments became my most trusted resources. It was easy for me to say no to chemotherapy. I knew that the quality of my living mattered much more to me than having my life extended by an extra few months. And one of the questions that Julie always asked, Julie, my daughter, was, well, what are we talking about? And they would say, well, a few months. And we'd both say no. My next decision was to commit to a very strict keto diet. Is there anybody else who's on a keto diet? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, it, um, the, the keto diet does absolutely deprive the cancer cells of the glucose they need to survive. I had no idea, though, when I made that decision, how hard it was going to be to make the transition to using fat as my body's source of energy instead of glucose. And it's still hard, so congratulations to you who are on it. My treatment plan also involved finding a very knowledgeable and dedicated acupuncturist who treats me twice a week using a Chinese approach to working with cancer and a lot of Qigong exercises. I engaged in a modified version of Michael Brofman's exercise program. He had you exercising for 10 to 15 minutes every hour of the day, and that was not me. But I did do a modified program and have stayed with that. I also did a lot of meditative practices, and I learned to maneuver my walker all over the brick cobblestones of Old Town so that I could keep walking. It was during the months of October, November and December of 2022 that I felt the sickest physically as my body transitioned from using glucose to using fat for energy. 
Along with feeling so physically sick, there was a terrible sense of urgency that I could die at any time. Those six months were just going by so quickly, and there were so many things that I still had to do. I truly don't know how I would have, or if I would have, and I'm not saying that lightly, if I would have made it through those early months without my incredible support system, which included my dear friend Adi, who, and Bodhi, <laughs> our Australian toy shepherd, who came to live with me and who shared her extensive knowledge, energy, and physical, practical, and emotional skills with me. My daughter, Julie, come on, there you are, in the back, who came to every single medical appointment with me to ask all the questions I never would have thought of, provide me with her medical knowledge and help, help me stay in the moment uh, instead of awfulizing, which I do very well. And she had a way of staying calm and saying, let's look at what's going on right now. And by the way, that's become my, one of my mantras, right now. Right now, I am alive. I am not feeling pain. I am here being supported by this incredible community right now. I also want to mention Jan McPherson. And <laughs> she looks so startled. And the wonderful, the amazing care team that we have here at MVUC as a resource. And one of the things that got left out of my introduction was that I'm also a joyful participant of the MVUC Book Club. And some of my bookies are here today. They were always available for rides and entertainment and visits, and also several of my neighbors, two of whom are also here today, Donna and Mike, who have been so supportive. In addition, I found a wonderful therapist who has ministered to many people with cancer. With her insights and wisdom, her sense of humor, and her willingness to work with me and my out-of-the-box spirituality and psychology, I knew Jane could serve as my trusted and caring safety valve, holding my fears and my grief for me apart from the close circle of family and friends who were going through their own emotional journey. The next section I entitled, I Will Not Be a Victim. And when I think of what, it has, what has been the major support for me going through this, that's one of the majors. I will not be a victim. Through all of this, I got clear on how important it was to me to realize how much control I had in so many important aspects of my life. My diet, my exercise, my personal boundaries, my activities, my interactions with people, and to an extent that's possible, even my thoughts and feelings. For someone who had always lived a very fast-paced life, I became overly protective of my time and energy. In one week, uh, this was 2022, I removed myself from almost all of the leadership positions and activities I had been involved with, both here at the church and in my, fam my professional association, NTL Institute for Applied Behavioral Sciences. I also told family and friends from other parts of the country that I was not up to visits for last winter. For the first time in my life, I said no five times as often <laughs> as I said yes to anything. And I focused almost exclusively on myself and my well-being. I spent a lot of time thinking about what quality of life really meant to me at this stage. And it came down to enjoying and maintaining my relationships with family and friends, and finding ways to continue to contribute, which has always been so important to me. But I needed to do it with my new reality. I didn't have the same kind of energy, so I had to think 
very creatively about how can I do things in short spurts as opposed to taking on great big long six month projects. Another thing I did that was very helpful was I asked all my friends to keep their eyes and ears open to identify musical, theatrical, political, cultural, and outdoor activities that we might enjoy going to together. Having so many friends with very different tastes in all these areas has resulted in my getting to enjoy a wonderfully diverse set of activities, some of which I probably never would have ever known about if I hadn't asked for what I wanted, which was another big learning. Another change I made was to find ways to make my small world larger is the way I conceptualized it. I had previously done a, ver a fair amount of global traveling both for my work and for pleasure and had also gone on two mile walks every day enjoying all of the seasonal changes greatly. Now I spend a lot of time, more time, in my own patio sometimes taking a half an hour just sitting, listening, listening to the birds, watching the clouds, or noticing the daily changes down to the opening of individual flowering buds in my planters. I haven't tried running naked through the garden yet. <laughs> Not sure where I'm gonna go with that one. But I often have the sense that I have just spent a period of time almost in a time warp which is such a new thing for me. I remember sitting around the 2022 Thanksgiving table with my kids and grandkids and thinking about how this was likely the last time that I would be with them for this kind of celebration. Whenever I depressed myself with that thought, I reminded myself that right at that moment, I was alive, enjoying talking with them, playing the competitive team games that we like to engage in, and eating as much turkey as I wanted, and even having two, slice, two bites, not slices, of pie. I was aware, too, that I was much more relaxed now that I was no longer dealing with all the expectations that I had carried around for so many years about how the holidays should go, how things should be with the family, and, how, and with my four grandkids. Another very important part of how I see myself managing has been to bring closure to relationships. Almost from the moment I learned about my diagnosis, I had started thinking about the really significant relationships in my life and what I needed to do to say, to, or, say, or say to feel that I had really managed closure, for, at least for my part. I started with my son, Rob, and daughter, Julie, while we had always had pretty close relationships and were able to talk about most things, there were a couple of issues I still had deep regrets about from the time of my divorce to their father. I wrote them each a long letter telling them how sorry I was about the issues and wishing that I had been able to handle things better at the time. Originally, I was going to give them the letters on my death. And then I realized, no, I really wanted them to have them now so that we could have some discussion about what their reactions were. And we did. And I think that our relationships have been even better for the conversations which we've had since then. Then I thought about what I wanted to say to my four grandkids, Scout, Gray, Cal, and Evan, who are all in their 20s now. The idea of doing some kind of my life story just was absolutely overwhelming. No way, 83 years. And I can remember m most of my sessions with my therapist have been over Zoom. And I can remember leaning forward and saying, no way, no way, I am not going to cover 83 years. And then I said, and who says I have to? Only me. And I said, what I wanna do is just pull out the chapters the things that have really made a difference to me and made me who I am now. That's what I want them to know. So, some excerpts from the autobiography that I'm never going to write <laughs> got written. And with the help of Adi, who is doing a little illustrating for me, they're almost done now. Uh, 
There were also three close friends with whom I had some cleaning up to do. And when they came from various parts of the country, we did that. At that point, I was feeling pretty good about everyone, except my one sibling, my younger brother, Marty, who lived in Sacramento, California. <clears throat> While we had almost always maintained a cordial and loving relationship on the surface, it felt mostly transactional to me and I had a strong desire for us to get to know each other more deeply at this point. Very unexpectedly, he became very ill in May of this year, and he died on September 7th. On his good days, we talked to some degree, but we were never able to connect in the way that I had hoped. During the last few weeks of his life, the most I was able to do on most days was to have the nurse just hold the phone up to him so that I could tell him I loved him. I am still feeling, as you can tell, a lot of grief and loss, and I wish so much that we could have gotten to know each other more deeply. So, how do I live with the knowledge that I'm dying? Each of us responds differently to life's challenges. I try my best to find some kind of balance I think of it as sort of living in this space, some kind of balance between accepting day-to-day -day reality of living with the diagnosis of terminal illness without totally giving up hopefulness, because I believe that our energetic thoughts do influence the universe. So there are days when I hardly ever even think about having cancer. I've been blessed with not much pain and not much illness from the cancer. I'm 83 years old, so I ache all the time. And I, <laughs> like we all do. <laughs> and I have um, COPD and I have peripheral neuropathy. So sometimes I'm not in such great shape, but I am still not feeling sick. Um, <clears throat> knowing that I have done all that I know how to do to keep from feeling like a victim has helped me to stay grounded and to feel proud of myself for living the best life that I can. Having this illness has mellowed me out, helped me understand what's important and what isn't for me, made me so much more appreciative of the wonderful support and love with which I'm surrounded, and it's increased my compassion for us all. As I finish, I want to share with you I've been thinking a lot about what are my life wisdoms that I wanted to share with the grandkids. And I, being compulsive, I forced myself to think only of kin. So um, I've been speaking, uh, thinking over the last year of the 10 life wisdoms that mean the most to me, at least right now. And that's what I'd like to share with you as I finish. These 10 important influences have helped me live my best possible life keeping me in right relationship with myself, the people I love, and my community during this phase of my life. Number one, do whatever you have to do through therapy, journaling, reading, talking with friends, spending time alone in nature, meditating, whatever, to get to the point where you truly love yourself. Only then can you truly love others. And number two is sort of a correlation. Truly loving yourself and others does not mean that you or they have no faults, fears, or rough edges to work on. Rather, it means that you can acknowledge Ill these human imperfections with feelings of compassion and forgiveness for yourself as well as others. Number three may be a different thought for you. Remind yourself every day that there is no such thing as the one real truth or right perspective on anything, on anything. For reinforcement, if you are interested, you can watch Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. It took me a long time to be able to pronounce her name. She's from Nigeria and has written some wonderful books. And she has a TED Talk 
called The Danger of a Single Story. Really worth looking at. Number four, probably is not new to you. Live with a sense of purpose and joy. And find something to be kind about every day. Number five, Howard and I always used to talk about dynamic and static relationships and to remind ourselves that we have the capacity to grow and change literally every day of our lives. Who we are yesterday, who we were yesterday, is not necessarily who we are today. And so whoever you are dealing with, whether it's yourself, your lover, your friend, your neighbor, remind yourself to be in the moment, to say, who is this person and who am I today, not yesterday? It's a hard thing to do, but it really has a lot of benefits to it. And in order to do that, you have to truly be present in the moment and listening deeply to whatever's going on. Number seven, see if you can find the cosmic giggle, that bit of humor or irony that exists in almost every situation, and try not to take yourself too seriously. Number eight, never go to sleep without identifying everything you appreciate from the day you just lived. Number nine, and this was a real lesson for me, take the time to know what it is you truly need and then ask for it. People are always free to say yes or no in response. And finally, number 10, spirit is real. There is a force that guides this universe, call it what you will, but know that there is something that connects all living things in purposeful ways. September 26, 2023 was the one year anniversary since I had been told I had six to 12 months to live. Every few months I have had a PET scan or a series of CT scans and a visit with my very traditional oncologist who said the last time, Julie, wow, this is a surprisingly positive response, report. Quote, three times now, the scans have shown positive results with tumors shrinking or remaining exactly the same size, only two very small new tumors forming, which were quickly sap zapped away with radiation, and a decrease in cancer cell uptake activity. I had no idea what that was, but how I define it for myself, it's the cancer cells slurping the glucose and replicating themselves. And if there's no glucose for them to slurp, they can't replicate themselves. But as I am well, oh, so, and that, when I started, uh, the uptake activity was somewhere six to seven, and the last time it was tested, it was one to two. I am well aware, though, as long as there is one active tumor, metastasized cancer can show up at any time, anywhere, so in a very real sense, I'm living on borrowed time. The reality is that all of us are right now living as we die. It's just that some of us might have a more definitive sense of when that might be. And then again, maybe we don't. As we welcome 2024 into our lives, I invite each of you to consider the questions and the life wisdoms that make sense to you as you live each precious day of this new year. Blessed be.